Good afternoon. Welcome to the session on compelling cases in orbit and oculoplastic surgery. I have as my co-moderator, Professor Urmil Chawla. Convener is Dr. Hariram Oja. And co-convener is Dr. Nam Namita Kumari. And we are waiting for the moderator, Dr. Fairuz. We'll start with the first speaker that is as listed, Farhat Parveen. Farhat Parveen. Yeah, this is the final list I have anyway. Doesn't matter if the sequence is a little different. Uh, case presentation is for four minutes, followed by three minutes of discussion. That is the format. So please adhere, your, adhere to your time. Farhat is a postgraduate, third year postgraduate student in NMCH Patna. A very good evening to everyone. I, Dr. Farhat Parveen, third year PG from NMCH Patna. Today I am going to present an unusual case of orbital cysticercosis. I have no financial interest. <coughs> to discuss my case, a 32-year female came to our OPD with chief complaint of pain, redness, left eye, swelling and bulging around left eye since 15 to 20 days. My patient was asymptomatic 15 to 20 days ago. Then she developed pain, redness, swelling, and bulging around left eye, which was sudden in onset, gradual progression, and unilateral. Patient was using topical antibiotic and antihistaminic and oral antibiotics prescribed elsewhere. There was no history of damnation of vision, no history of insect bite, ocular trauma, or foreign body, no history of any aggravating or relieving factor. There was no any significant past medical and surgical history. There was no history of spectacle use or any ocular procedure. On general examination, patient was conscious, cooperative, and well-oriented to time, place, and person. Her pulse rate was 68 per minute, and BP was 120 upon 70 mm of Hg. Systemic examination were within normal limit. <coughs> On ocular examination, her visual acuity were 6 by 6 in both eyes. Extraocular movement in right eye was free, full, and painless, whereas in left eye, there is restriction in adduction and abduction. There was mild diffuse upper eyelid edema, tenderness, local rise of temperature, and axial proptosis in left eye, rest within normal limit. In this image, we can show left eye restricted eye movement in adduction and abduction. On anterior segment examination, there was mild congestion and chemosis of conjunctiva of left eye, rest within normal limit. IOP of right eye was 15 mm of Hg and left eye was 18 mm of Hg. Sac were patent in both eye, fundus were within normal limit in both eye. Differential diagnosis could be thyroid related orbitopathy, orbital pseudotumor, parasitic infection of orbit. We had done routine and radiological imaging. On routine investigation, CBC within normal limit, absolute snowfill count 300 cells per microliter, ESR rays, RBS 96 mg per DL, LFT, KFT, thyroid function test within normal limit, stool examination didn't show any ova or cyst, ELISA for anti cysty circle antibody, patient not willing. On radiological examination, B scan of left eye revealed well-defined and echoic lesion noted in medial rectus muscle with an echogenic focus within, most likely scolex. We had advised CE, CT, brain and orbit which show bulky left medial rectus muscle containing a small cystic lesion with surrounding edematous changes, possibility of myocystic sarcosis. CE, CT, brain didn't reveal anything significant. Diagnosis was cystic sarcosis of left eye medial rectus muscle. We had given oral albendazole 15 mg per kg body weight in divided dose BD for 4 weeks and tapped redness alone 1 mg per kg bo body weight OD which was tapered over 4 weeks to counter the inflammatory response of local tissue. After 1 week post treatment, patient returned with massive chemosis with periorbital swelling of left eye and severe restriction in ocular movement due to toxin released by dying cyst. Inflammation incited by dead parasite was taken care by topical steroid. On follow-up, patient improved gradually. There was marked improvement of clinical sign on this thera therapy. To conclude, <coughs> this was the pre-treatment photograph and this was the post-treatment photograph at one month follow-up showing resolution of inflammation and extraocular motility were full and free in all gazes in both eye. We had done contrast enhanced MRI after two months of post-treatment which show no cystic lesion and marked reduction in inflammatory response of surrounding tissue. 
Coming to my discussion part, cysticercosis is an infestation caused by cysticercus cellulose, the larval form of pork tip from tinea solium. Consumption of undercooked pork and use of contaminated food or water can cause this infection. Cysticercosis is endemic to region with poor sanitation. Orbital cysticercosis has varied presentation like acquired strabismus, diplopia, recurrent redness, proptosis, ptosis, restricted ocular motility. <coughs> Different ocular form are eyelid cysts, subconjunctival cysts, cyst in anterior chamber, intravitreal cysts and subretinal cysts. To conclude, ocular cysticercosis can have varied clinical presentation which is non-specific and better diagnosed with thorough imaging. Serology and stool analysis are also useful for diagnosis. Judicious use of oral steroid and antiparasitic agent help in remission of cyst and is the main stay of treatment. Important to be aware of clinical presentation to ophthalmic parasite for proper diagnosis and management to prevent site threatening and lifetime threatening complication. Thank you so much. You did it, manage it well in the routine way we do it. Hmm. Was there anything unusual you think you found in your case? Unusual uh, on management, ma'am. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Inflammatory uh. response was unusual because it's not a common thing to have inflammatory response because of a dead parasite when the patient is already under cover of steroids. Yes. That was uh, a yeah. little unusual. Otherwise, I think it's a routine management. It's very yes. nicely managed case. Yes. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. What we are doing, I, I want any movement restriction if it's there, if complete recovery, then what we are doing? So this is the point I want to make. Some sort of it depends on how much myositis component the patient has. If it is intramuscular cysticercosis, there is bound to be myositis. And these patients sometimes heal with scarring of the extraocular muscle, resulting in ocular motility restriction, which generally resolves over a period of time, three to six months or so. If it doesn't, or if the restriction is quite severe, and on imaging, the cyst is gone. Cyst is completely collapsed. The scolex is missing. And it's just the myositis component. You can continue with oral steroids for a few more weeks. Otherwise, intraorbital steroid injection in the location of inflammation is also fine. So these are the two measures that you can take. Yeah. Right. right. I think about more than half or two-thirds of cases fall into the category that she presented. They <laughs> resolve without, <laughs> right. About one-third of patients may have ocular motility <laughs> restriction. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. So that resolves over a period of time. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So like, uh, is that in your patient, have you noticed any diplopia? Because that was the, not in your complaints, like patient, because the patient has restriction. So there should be the, because the, that is the usually complaint. Patient, patient not complaining of diplopia, ma'am. Okay, uh -huh. so like for the documentation part also, mm -hmm. if you have that muscle restriction, then mm -hmm. you should go for the diplopia checking. Okay. And another thing that I wanted to like, MRI is good, but even when you suspect that uh, myositis sarcosis, the first investigation is that your should be the B scan. Okay. That is even the di definitive diagnostic for that. Yes, ma'am. So you don't need the MRI and CT uh, until you could not pick that in on the B scan. Yes, sir, ma'am, we advise uh, ultrasonography and CCT at the same time. So. Uh, next talk is uh, by Dr. Jolly Rothgi. The topic is the unusual case of lady mangioma. I think one of her residents is going to present. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. James.
Today I'm presenting an unusual case of lead hemangioma. Uh, a 40-year-old middle-aged female presented with a three-month history of A 40-year-old female, middle-aged female, presented with a three-month history of painless, progressively increasing swelling over the left upper eyelid and drooping of left upper lip. There is no history of visual impairment, trauma, or evidence of any systemic disease. On examination, a single well oval-shaped lid mass measuring 2.5 cm and 2 cm was present at the middle and lateral part of left upper eyelid, just below the superior orbital rim. It was soft with well-demarcated edges, non-tender, non-pulsatile, compressible, mobile. Trans-elimination test was negative and not attached to the either to the skin or the underlying structure. The mass appears to be in the subcutaneous plane and the skin overlying the mass was normal. On everting the upper eyelid, the conjunctiva and fornix were healthy. There was no increase in size with valsalva maneuver and no breed was heard in auscultation. Um, the visual equity is six by six uh, and then uh, the eyebrows were normal and the eyelids, there was moderate tosis on the left side with no ectropion or entropion. The palpable aperture on the left side, the height was 7 mm and there was no restriction in, in the eyeball movement or there is no proptosis or globe displacement. Anterior segment examination with the pupil was within normal limit and fundus thorough fundus examination was within normal limit. On doing investigation, the routine investigation were within normal limit. Her CT scan report of orbit revealed a soft tissue mass with a well-defined border, no extension into the orbit suggestive of epidermoidsis. The FNSC re report suggested a resolving hematoma. Uh, based on the CT report, the provisional diagnosis was made as epidermoidsis, but since the swelling was soft in consistency, differential diagnosis like epidermoidsis, resolving hematoma, hemangioma, arteriovenous malformation, lymphangioma, and ivorexis can be kept in mind. Uh, management. The management was done under surgical excisional biopsy under local anesthesia. Uh, here we have given elliptical incision and then with blunt dissection we have gone till the posterior border. Then the lesion was separated from the underlying structure. This uh, intraoperative finding, uh, the excised mass was not well encapsulated. It was multi-lubulated, highly vascular with areas of hemorrhages. It measures around 1.5 to 1.2 centimeter and there were no large feeder vessels and no extension into orbit. Postoperatively, Significant improvement of tosis at one month of follow-up. On her histological report, uh, there was large dilated blood-filled vascular spaces with thrombosis separated by fibrous trauma. Uh, the impression came out as suggestive of cavernous hemangioma. Uh, discussion. Uh, cavernous hemangioma is the most common vascular benign tumor of the in adults in orbit usually happening in the female, and then it presents with gradual onset of symptoms. However, it has been shown that cavernous hemangioma has a more rapid growth in case of extraconal location. Isolated subcutaneous cavernous hemangioma of the eyelid is a rare entity. Our case here involves the upper eyelid without involving the orbit and other adenexa. Uh, this may cause visual disturbance and because of mechanical tosis and rarely globe displacement or astigmatism. Conclusion, this is a rare case of isolated subcutaneous cavernous hemangioma of the eyelid without involving the orbit. It is easily misdiagnosed and should be kept in mind as the differential diagnosis for any well-defined eyelid tumor. Thank you. Nicely presented. Uh, rare location, but a very common tumor. Uh, does any of the audience have any questions for James? Could it have been managed any differently? No.
Nobody has, has any questions? Any of the panelists? Should we go for some contrast? MRI diffusion uh, weighted images would have helped you arrive at the diagnosis anyway, but surgery was the treatment of choice and you went ahead with surgery. That's great. Yes, yes, sir. Sir, uh, actually, uh, we didn't do uh, contrast and MRI angiography and all because uh, we thought the CD came out as epidermoid C, so we thought this would be the one, and patient refused to go for the next investigation. If you are dealing any vascular yeah. malformation. Yes. MRI angiography is the must, I think. So. Yes. This one. Yes. With contrast. Yes. This is the one. Then. If arterial flow, ma'am, then bleeding during the surgery, bleeding is the problem. And then we have not to able to just control it. During the surgery, intraoperatively, this is a very difficult to tackle it. So like, uh, I just, uh, because even uh, this is a rare entity, and even I had two, three cases of the similar presentation. Yes, sir. But in that case, uh, the overlying uh, skin has a little uh, purplish hue. Ha, this so that give you uh, the idea. Ha. And as it was a very small mass, and because the valsalva is negative, you know that yes. uh, this is, uh, if you are going to excise it, it's not going to bleed. And as Sir is mentioning that the arterial bleed could be. So even for that, then you should keep that glue assisted for a small incision, um, a small uh, lesion like this. Glue yes. assisted excision can also be done. Yes. And if the art is there, you can just clamp. <laughs> 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 Not <laughs> inject the glue in that. But this is a very small lesion. I don't think that. Uh, in my case, so there was. Uh, I have also two, three cases. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next, I think we have to check with uh, the next speaker as listed is Dr. Uh, Sarah Rizvi, is she here? Dr. Rizvi? Then we'll go on to the next presentation, that is Ashmita Adhikari, is she here? Ashmita, go ahead. She is presenting on a rare case of uh, congenital <coughs> upper lid ectropion in a colloidian baby. She is also from RIO Patna. Second year junior resident. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Ashmita from RIO IJMS Patna. I present a case of congenital ectropian correction surgery in a colloidian baby. I have no financial or conflict of interest. A three month old female child was brought to the RIO OPD with complaints of peeling parchment like brownish membranes over face, body outturned eyelids, fish-like mouth, coiled up ears since birth, with restricted limb movements and suckling difficulty as seen in these two images. The child was born prematurely with brownish membranes since birth, was active alert from birth overall, however, there were recurrent attacks of low-grade fever. Dermatology department and pediatric department consultation were done respectively for these complaints. Parents had history of consanguineous marriage, no history of similar condition, however, was present in the past or in the family. The birth weight was 2 kgs, that is low birth weight, was delivered by lower segment caesarean section at 36 completed weeks of gestation. Pregnancy had been uncomplicated with normal cry at birth and history of Niku stay overnight for observation was present. In general examination, as observed, yellowish parchments like peeling of membranes over face and body were seen with everted leaves, 
rudimentary coiled up ears and flat nasal bridge systemic examination was within normal limit in local examination of the eyes severe degree of both eyes upper lid eversion with mild lower lid eversion severe lid edema conjunctival chemosis and both eye corneal opacities due to exposure keratitis were present final diagnosis arrived at clinically was congenital lamellar ichthyosis with bilateral congenital ectropion exposure keratitis eclabium of lips with underdeveloped ears since the baby was hemodynamically stable without any evidence of dehydration or infection as are common complications of a colloidal baby so initially conservative management was planned with hourly installation of cmc 0.5% eye drop tobramycin 0.3% every 3 hourly hpmc 2% every 4 hourly with topical retinoids and emollients for softening of skin in hope for spontaneous correction of the condition on weekly follow ups parchment peeling all over body was observed however in the eyes though lid edema decreased and eye opening was observed partially ectropion did not correct so after 3 weeks of conservative management surgery was planned pre operative investigations for anesthetic fitness were done along with eco and usg whole abdomen which were within normal limit and pre anesthetic clearance was obtained on table femoral line was secured due to failed attempts at peripheral iv cannulation due to the membranes covering the limbs in the surgical technique first the upper lid was marked along the upper eyelash margin and separated till the tarsal plate it was inverted upon itself and secured with 40 mer silk at the lateral canthus and amniotic membrane grafted in place as seen in this video first the lid is being separated and inverted on itself and secured with sutures then the amniotic membrane is giving ga grafted over the exposed tarsal plate immediate post up picture with lid inversion and amniotic membrane sutured in place is seen at 7 day follow up however the lateral canthal sutures had lo loosened so resuturing with temporary tarsorhapy was repeated under sedation another similar case had presented at rio opadi at 1 month of age with bilateral mild lid ectropion but the cornea in this case was clear and intact so this case was also initially managed conservatively condition in this case however improved significantly within 4 weeks and complete lid closure was achieved without any corneal damage and therefore did not progress to surgery in discussion ichthyosis is a group of inherited disorders of epidermal differentiation where the cell kinetics of differentiation is altered with the desquamation defect leading to excessive keratin build up forming excessive scales Overall it is of four types ichthyosis vulgaris is the most common condition but it is comparatively mild with good prognosis x-linked ichthyosis has a is a moderate a uh, severity condition with good prognosis it is present only in males both these condition occur after 3 months of age as in this case lamellar ichthyosis that is a colloidal baby has a autosomal recessive inheritance so history of consanguineous marriage is important it is of severe condition which causes serious disability and present since birth involves all over that is flexures neck face scalp palms and soles without sparring any area which are however present in ichthyosis vulgaris and x linked ichthyosis It is characterized by large quadrangular scales with associated ectropion and eclabium due to tortus of skin. Fourth variety is epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. It is similar to lamellar ichthyosis present since birth. However, it becomes less severe with age. Hence to conclude, colloidal baby is a rare congenital anomaly present in 1 per 3 lakh live birth. the brown parchment peels off and falls off in due course of several weeks but treatment or ectropion is required at an early basis otherwise it may uh, 
lead to exposure keratitis and permanent corneal opacities. Conservative management may lead to spontaneous correction in many cases. However, surgical intervention is required in some cases of congenital ectropion as well. In surgery, generally release and coverage with skin or membrane grafting partial or full thickness is done. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation and a nice management as well. Gyan Bhaskar was the one who managed it, I suppose, right? I thank you, sir. The first case was uh, discussed with the Santosh, sir. And under his guidance, we managed the case. And really, it was uh, our uh, first experience, sir. And thanks to you, sir, for your guidance. Just a question for you, like, uh, did you, uh, what was the protocol that you managed for the topical retinoid, as you mentioned? Topically, you had given mm -hmm. uh, retinoids, right? So, so that was done by a dermatology consultation. Okay, okay. So, like, twice or thrice per day, moistening the skin. Right. So, so. Uh, there is a protocol that uh, is established uh, for the ichthyosis protocol. Mm -hmm. Even you, as uh, ophthalmologists, can uh, uh, treat the patient very easily. Uh, there are five, four things that we follow. One is that we give systemically acetretinoin. Mm -hmm. We can give 10 to 25 milligrams tablet or 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per day is the regimen. And we can give that tablet once a day. Uh, we ourselves can uh, uh, prescribe it. Uh, in, in the baby, it comes to, oh yes, yes. Sir. And uh, not just, I'm not just talking about the babies. In general, I'm talking about ichthyosis. And uh, topically, we can uh, prepare Moisturex uh, along with, uh, uh, mixed with Eudina gel. And uh, like, you know, that can be applied 5 is to 1 ratio all over the body twice a day. So uh, what we do is that we prepare the patients before the surgery for a few weeks so that the, uh, you know, the crusting and the, uh, the skin itself will get better by the time. And cleaning with betadine is also advocated. We also give topical retinoids to these patients and over uh, uh, over the time, at least six to eight weeks or 10 weeks, we have waited and we have seen that the skin settles down and then we have gone ahead with intervention. So those ichthyosis protocols can actually be followed by us ourselves. We don't need to bank on the dermatologist directly because many dermatologists uh, don't resort to topical and systemic retinoids. So that can be kept. For upper, upper lid is more common. Upper is more common. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Sandhya Yadav available? Okay, so Dr. Sandhya Yadav is going to speak on delayed presentation of intraorbital foreign body. Okay, so sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Sandhya Yadav, final year postgraduate resident, GMCH Guwahati. I'm here to present delayed presentation of intraorbital foreign body, a case report. Introduction, ocular trauma is one of the leading cause of blindness in the world, with foreign bodies being responsible for over 16% of these injuries. Organic foreign bodies uh, like wooden chips can serve as a source of infectious which can be lethal. Therefore, it is advised to find and remove foreign bodies as soon as possible. While most intraorbital foreign bodies are metallic or glass particle, intraorbital wooden foreign bodies are relatively rare. Here, we report a case in which a piece of wood remained undetected in the orbit for several months. Uh, so a six-year-old male presented to our OPD with a lid mass on right upper lid with inability to fully close his eyes since one month. 
There was a history of lid laceration right upper lid due to self fall from bicycle 8 months back for which primary repair was done in primary healthcare peripheral healthcare on examination a uh, visual acuity was normal that is 6 by 6 on both sides there was a single firm freely mobile horizontally oval swelling of approximately 1 into 1 cm present on superonatal aspect of right upper lid with excoriation of the overlying skin. On closing the lid, mild leg ophthalmus was seen. Ocular movements were full, free and painless in all directions. As we can see, pre presentation of a 6 year old child. Uh, first row, uh, single swelling. Uh, and second picture, there was a mild leg ophthalmus. Uh, for this case, we went for X-ray orbit and CT orbit as well, but no foreign body was found in both the imaging. But due to financial constraints, patient did not undergo MRI. So clinically, uh, wound was uh, wound was planned to explore under general anesthesia. Preoperatively, oral antibiotics was started. Anterior orbitomy was done through an incision along the lid crease under general anesthesia to decrease chances of scar. Blunt dissection was done and wooden foreign body of size 6 mm was noted which was grasped with the help of artery forceps and removed completely along with the granulation tissue. The wound track was explored for any remnants of the wooden piece and then the orbit was copiously irrigated with antibiotic solution and wound was closed using 6-0 cell suture. Excised mass was sent for histological evaluation which was suggestive of granulation tissue only. Postoperatively oral antibiotics and oral analgesics was continued for 7 more days. Suture was released after 1 week and wound was healed with minimal scarring and no residual bulging. First picture uh, is an intraoperative photo of wound exploration. Second we can see there was a foreign body found which was 6 mm which we did not suspect as the child was, uh, the parents said that uh, the suturing was done perfectly after cleaning of wound. And third picture, uh, there was a microscopic photo. Discussion, in our case, patient, uh, patient presented with intraorbital wooden foreign body, mimicking lid mass. Leg of thalmus was probably due to wound contracture. Although foreign body like metal, plastic and glass are easily detected with conventional radiograph like x-ray organic foreign body like wood are often missed as seen in our case penetrating organic foreign body often lead to acute inflammatory reaction when left unremoved organic intra orbital foreign body like wood must be surgically removed and copiously irrigated with antibiotic as they often lead to infections and complications Conclusion, though wound cleaning is essential, thorough wound cleaning is essential prior to its closure to prevent any retained intraorbital foreign body. Surgical exploration is definitive approach for retained intraorbital foreign body in case of high clinical suspicion despite negative radiological imaging. Thank you. Thank you. It was a nicely managed case. Basically, granuloma formation had occurred, which had to be finally excised. Thank you. Uh, good evening everyone, uh, I am going to present a hair case, large intraconal mass, uh, the rare case is a sonoma. As we know the sonoma are the slow growing benign peripheral nursery tumor, 
that originate from the Swan cells. Uh, here, uh, a case presented with uh, us, a uh, 45 year old female uh, with a complaint of uh, uh, severe pain, redness, watering, loss of vision, and bulge of the right eyeball from about six months. This you see the photo here of the right eye. And history revealed the bulging of the eyeball started two years ago. And it was painless and uh, progressive in nature uh, since uh, ever. Uh, on examination, there was a severe uh, propensity of the right eye with conjunctival chemosis, exposure keratopathy, cornea ulcer, and pupillas uh, mid dilated, either maybe due to the pharmacological or maybe due to the compressive lesion. Because uh, we just see here uh, only the cornea is uh, the killer above uh, upper portion. And the visual acuity was only perception of light and projection phase was inaccurate. Detail of the entire chamber uh, was not visible, fundus was not visualized. Uh, USG revealed posterior segment was within normal limit and uh, ultrasound uh, on the posterior uh, retroorbital there is a mass lesion. And left eye was uh, within uh, normal limit. On systemic examination, the patient was perfectly oriented with time, place, and person. And on examination, there is no lymphadenopathy, preauricular, cervical, submandibular lymph nodes were not palpable. Uh, abdomen was soft, uh, chest, TBS, and CNS was with the normal limit. And patient was advised the uh, abdomen whole, uh, whole abdomen ultrasound, X-ray, and relevant blood uh, investigation done, and everything was with the normal limit. There is no uh, sign of any metastasis. MRI uh, with contrast and CT scan was advised uh, to know the nature, extent, and underlying bony condition. Uh, you see here the radiologically, uh, the patient large, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in large, uh, well defined 2.5 to 3.5 centimeter uh, with the mild en enhancement uh, on contrast is seen in the cystic lesion, the intercolonal compartment, uh, mostly in the superior temporal aspect, extending up the uh, apex region, and intending uh, of the optic nerve. Uh, on CTS scan, there is no uh, distortion of the bony, uh, there is no uh, bony erosion on CT plate. Uh, on the radiological uh, basis, because it is uh, insistent, well-defined, so we plan to uh, do the surgery and surgery was uh, uh, done on the uh, the incision was given on uh, super uh, temporal fornix cancer tommy was done and uh, after uh, conjunctiva uh, exploration of conjunctiva and uh, we also uh, cut the little mid uh, uh, little uh, muscle Let and then uh, and, uh, cyst was removed in total. We debulk the tumor uh, because the cystic fluid is there and so it become easy to uh, remove the whole of the cyst. And it was sent for histopathological examination. On histopathological examination, the section so on low grade, the hypercellular and hypocellular area, and also cystic uh, area is also seen, but on high uh, power uh, section, so uh, bodies, on another uh, high power view, there's the highlighting the uh, mostly vacuary body, and uh, as we know, uh, the vacuary body is were formed by the highly uh, ordered uh, uh, arrangement of the swan cell nuclei in the row uh, separated by the fibrillary process. Uh, so, on the basis of this, uh, the uh, diagnosis was made a suggestive swan cell. And the follow-up, this is see here the photo of the patient whether day three and day one week. Initially, there was the mild edema, mechanical ptosis, but on later on at the age of uh, three months, patient regained good cosmesis and patient also regained the good vision. At least three meter, patient gained the vision and uh, corneal opacity, you see here, there is no corneal opacity, all the opacity subsided. Uh, so uh, on the discussion, uh, the first described with the Swanoma was uh, the Veco, uh, Veruke in 1908, uh, and it was a benign tumor originated from a swan cell of the peripheral uh, nerves, and it is uh, eco uh, accounting for only two to uh, one to two percent of all orbital neoplasm, and mostly it is present in the 20 to 20 years of age, and in the orbit, especially it uh, origins uh, origins uh, from the 
uh, ocular tumors, uh, trochlears, uh, trigeminal nerves, abducens nerves, as well as the, some sympathetic and parasympathetic fiber. Uh, orbital soloma mostly asymptomatic when it was a small, but they uh, gradually uh, grow and uh, progressively. And when the prophosis occurred, then patient went to the physician and ophthalmologist for the treatment. Uh, so, uh, well, while we are diagnosing the uh, schwannoma, these are the differential diagnosis we'll uh, keep in mind and accordingly uh, we can uh, proceed uh, further investigation, elevational del to rule out all these things. Uh, so, conclude that orbital schwannoma is relatively rare tumor and preoperative uh, diagnosis is difficult because it's uh, variable presentation and location and appropriate early assessment of the orbital tumor by CT or MRI and prompt management is warranted to prevent the development of severe complication. Uh, just uh, you see at the time of presentation and at the uh, uh, one year of age, uh, one year follow up, uh, there is no recurrence and patient uh, still have the good cost message and function and patient is so happy. Thank you so much for your patient hearing, sir. Very nicely managed, sir, and very surprising and good to see that not only the proptosis, but the cornea is showing very good result. The way it has recovered. Yes, sir. Previous primary picture. So, uh, I want to ask one question from you. Suppose that this patient is of 25 years, young female, and it may be the similar presentation, but the lesion is described, the pupil is normal, the mass is almost abutting the optic nerve. So what, because this, there was a similar girl that came to our OPD and earlier already somebody has done the partial debulking and after that uh, the recurrence happened, Sonoma tend to recur sometimes and and that time it was the same presentation. So uh, actually there is Later. a chances of uh, vision loss and patient vision is 6 by 6 and patient is here. So how will you approach this? Treatment of choice is complete excision, otherwise it tends to recur. But if it's intraconal location is rare, right? So in such a situation, sometimes it may be arising from a motor nerve, such as one of the branches of the third nerve. Then if you try to excise it, there will be obviously paralytic strabismus, entosis, etc. So in such situations, the only conservative management that is possible is debulking of the lesion and low-dose external beam radiation. Right. Proton beam, of course, everything is possible, but these are very expensive. Thank you, sir. And next, do we have Dr. Sanchari Chakravarti? Okay. So she's going to speak on intraocular metastasis in a known case of diffuse large B cell lymphoma of abdominal. Good evening everyone, myself Dr. Shonsari Chakravorty and I am a secondary DNB resident in Sri Shankaradeva Netra lab, Assam. Uh, I have no financial interest and today I will be presenting a case on a intraocular metastasis in a known case of diffuse large B cell lymphoma of abdomen. This 69 years old lady who presented to us in a, who was earlier diagnosed with abdominal diffuse large B cell lymphoma for last two years and she had undergone six cycles of chemotherapy. She also suffers from comorbidity of hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus. She presented mainly with loss of vision, pain, watering and headache. On examination, we found out that the right eye vision is very poor, only perception of light to is present, while the inaccuracy in the perception of the light. She had a history of cataract surgery four years ago, so the both eyes are pseudophagic. On anterior chamber examination by a slit lamp, we found out that there is grade one hyphema and grade two anterior cells and grade two anterior cells flare. We did an IOP uh, checkup via Goldman attenuation tonometry and it came out to be around 42 millimeter of mercury in the right eye. The left eye findings were normal. For following the investigation, we found out in the USG B scan, there is a retinal detachment and we can also see that there is an increase in the retinochoroidal thickness. We did an MRI and we can see there is a choroidal mass which shows, along with it shows uh, 
uh, on T2 enhanced, we can see there is a hypointense mass and there is an RD as well. Now, uh, we, uh, the patient already underwent a PT CT scan which showed uh, multiple uptakes of FDG in the various parts of the body, including in the cervical lymph nodes. Now, to correlate our uh, suspicion that the patient might have gone undergone any kind of ocular metastasis, we did an AC tap and it revealed that the malignant monomorphic lympho lymphomatous cells consistent with the intraocular spate. Thus, we uh, made an urgent radio-oncologist referral for further management since the patient is already in a debilitating state and she needs further management in the radio-oncology department. So lymphomas of the eye are uncommon and account only 1% of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and less than 1% of all intraocular tumors. Systemic lymphomas usually metastasize into eye via hematogenous spread and compromise only 17% of all intraocular lymphomas. Ocular involvement of systemic lymphoma usually presents as vitritis and posterior uveitis with distinct subretinal infiltrates. Occasionally, anterior uveitis and optic nerve involvement is also present. Definite diagnosis of this condition requires detection of the malignant lymphocytes in the ocular tissue or fluid specimens. In this case, a cytological examination of the aqueous sample reveal large pleomorphic lymphoid cells with irregular hyperchromatic nuclei prominent nucleoli, high nuclear and cytoplasmic ratio, prominent mitotic activity, which are consistent with the diagnosis of intraocular large B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. On discussion, we can say that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is a fast-growing, aggressive, and the most common subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, comprising 20 to 40% of all the lymphomas. Systemic lymphomas have a propensity to involve the uveal tissue secondarily and can masquerade itself as a panuveitis and elude the diagnosis. In our case as well, the secondary glaucoma is also common con occurrence in patients of intraocular lymphoma with uveal tissue involvement, probably due to the tumor infiltration directly to the angle or secondary to the angle neovascularization. So in conclusion, we can say this case illustrates that systemic non-Hodgkin lymphoma may also recur as long as two years later, such in our case as an intraocular process. This presentation also highlights that life-threatening malignant lymphoma may masquerade as anterior segment ocular inflammation or neovascular glaucoma and rarely hyphema. A high index of suspicion is mandatory and we should be aware of this presentation, especially in patients with the history of lymphoma. The key to diagnosis is di identification of atypical lymphoid cells in the ocular tissue or fluid supplements. Thank you. Nicely presented, but it's also uh, known that lymphoma can present synchronously in the eye along with systemic lymphoma. So you can't call it metastasis because eye can also be a primary site of lymphoma. Sir. If it's a multifocal disease. Yeah, it's, it's maybe primary and secondary as well. Right. For in our case, it's a secondary intraocular lymphoma since it we suspected the patient presented earlier is an abdominal diffuse large cell B cell. So we are suspecting it can be a secondary one which metastasis. Possibly, or it could be multifocal as well. Okay, you know, at the sir. same time, various parts of the body can have Affected. lymphoma. It's lymphoma is a systemic disease. It's not yes, a local sir. disease. Multi-systemic disease. In right. this patient, this patient also had a cervical... How was this patient disease. managed finally? Sir, we gave the general treatment of anti-glaucoma no, agents. No, no, no. Uh, oncologically? Oncologically, the patient underwent another cycle and unfortunately she passed away. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, last talk of the session by Dr. Shefali Jahar and she is going to speak on less is more management of a case of an adult unifocal orbital eosinophilic granuloma. Dr. Shefali along with Dr. Rolika is a well known face of eye focus also <laughs> <laughs> and of course Dr. Santosh says Thank you. 
very good evening everyone uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, aios and my mentor sir is sitting here for this wonderful opportunity my topic is less is more uh, in the case of unifocal orbital eosinophilic granuloma uh, i'm going to take you through a case of a 30 year old lady a medical student who presented to us with a swelling in the right eye which was present uh, in her for a period of three months uh, she said that it was associated with pain, which was more in the morning, and uh, she had a course of antihistaminics and antibiotics before she presented to us, but there was no resolution. Uh, there was no significant ocular or systemic history, and there was no history of any uh, diminution of vision, double vision or headache, no history of trauma, fever or allergy that was elicited. On examination, as you can see, there was fullness of the upper lid that was present. Uh, there was erythema that was present. Because of the lateral fullness, there was mitosis that was seen. Uh, the lateral orbital margin was irregular. There was uh, fullness um, of the temporal fossa. Firm, tender, ill-defined mass was palpable in the temporal fossa. Finger insulation and retroperitoneal was negative. There was no proptosis seen in this case, and ocular motility was free and full. Rest of the examination, as you can see, uh, was almost within normal limits. Radiological examination, she was actually carrying a CT film with her, uh, which was ordered by the uh, referral physician, which showed a right-sided osteolytic lesion in the zygomatic bone associated with soft tissue component in the orbit and the temporal fossa, a typical triradiate uh, lesion with lacrimal gland enlargement. Uh, we also, as you can see here, uh, we also ordered an MRI, which corroborated with the findings of the CT, uh, with a hyperintense lesion lateral orbit, uh, in the uh, lateral orbital wall, surrounding soft tissue swelling and lacrimal gland enlargement. So at this point of time, provisional clinical radiological diagnosis for this case actually was a right-sided intraosseous lesion, and our differentials at this point were osteomyelitis, uh, tuberculosis, that is, intraosseous dermoid with inflammation, or uh, eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, we went ahead with the orbitotomy with exploration and excision biopsy with intraoperative frozen section. Uh, it was an uncomplicated lateral orbitotomy. And as you can see, intraoperatively, granulation tissue was seen with bony uh, fragments, which was taken out. Frozen section was sent, which was uh, suggestive of a histiocystic lesion. And uh, we were awaiting the final uh, histopathological diagnosis and special stains, which came out to be negative. <coughs> On histopathology, as you can see here, uh, there were large epithelioid histocyte-like uh, Langerhelm cells were seen on a polymorphous background. This is a, a magnified view of the Langerhelm cells and the sheets of eosinophils. Uh, immuno immunohistochemistry confirmed the diagnosis of eosinophilic granuloma, wherein CD1A and S100 were strongly positive, as you can see here. Uh, we also went ahead with a systemic evaluation for her. Press CT scan was done and bone marrow biopsy, which came out to be negative. Hence, a final diagnosis for her was a uh, right-sided orbital unifocal eosinophilic granuloma, wherein the systemic examination was normal. Uh, she received right, uh, right eye intralesional triamcinol acetonide. One ml was administered. This is her picture after three months of uh, triamcinol uh, injection number one. And as you can see, radiologically also, the lytic lesion is seen in the zygoma, but bony remodeling has started. The resolution of soft tissue component can be very well seen here. Uh, subsequently, she, she received the second uh, uh, intralesional triamcinol acetonide injection. And at the last follow-up at 21 months, you can see beautifully the bone ha uh, has totally, uh, the bony remodeling can be fully seen. There's no lytic lesion seen. And soft tissue component has fully resolved. Hence, this is the uh, uh, presentation, uh, this is her picture at the presentation. And this is at 21 months of follow-up. And as you can see, there is full bone remodeling and complete resolution of the disease that can be seen. Uh, I'll quickly touch upon uh, the histiocytosis X, which includes eosinophilic granuloma, which is the most common of these uh, uh, presentations. And it, it depends on unifocality, multifocality, or acute disseminated disease, which can be Hanschuler uh, Christian disease, which is multifocal involvement, or lateral sewage disease, which is acute di disseminated fulminant disease. Eosinophil granuloma amongst these is the most common. It has a male preponderance uh, which presents in the first decade. It generally involves the frontal or the superotemporal bone. So the typical points that we saw in our case was that it was a female well into her 30s and a zygomatic bone was involved in her. Uh, a thorough systemic evaluation is mandatory in all, of, uh, all cases of histiocytosis. Uh, also, there are many treatment options available for Langerhans cell histocytosis based on the systemic involvement, unifocality, multifocality, whether dura is involved or whether it's an aggressive disease, which uh, ranges from biopsy with curettage 
steroid injections, uh, chemotherapy or radiation or a multimodal management. Uh, it is Pathog uh, the pathogenesis is actually a transient immune dysfunction which leads to cytokine mediated proliferation of pathologic uh, Langerhans cells. The osteolysis that we see is because of the interleukin 1 and prostaglandin E2. So the corticosteroids acts at this stage and hence in a unifocal orbital disease uh, when no systemic involvement is present the aggressive destruction that you saw actually responds very well to the intervention that was uh, demonstrated in the case. Hence in a unisystem uh, unifocal orbital eosinophilic glandoma, less is indeed more. Thank you so much for a patient listening. Nicely presented and very nicely managed. Sir is going to ask questions. No, no, I have no questions. <laughs> nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. If any, anybody else has any comments, questions on any of the cases that are presented? Otherwise, we'll end this session. Thank you so much.